Welcome back to my channel, everyone. Today, we are learning how to set up a Sony a7S III. Make sure you have the right camera and that you're not on the Sony a7 III. That's another video that you can look at in the description box below. But if you've got the a7S III, let's get it set up for video. Step one, we need to make sure we attach a lens and that we have one or two SD cards in there. If we don't, we're not gonna be able to unlock all of the features. So make sure you have that at minimum because then you can see everything in the menu. Also, make sure at the top, your shooting mode is set to video and not photo. As we go along, you can make sure that you're on the right page number by looking here. I'm not only just going to go through the settings, but also why. Why is it when I turn on this, it shuts off this because the manual doesn't explain that and there's no way to know unless you have somebody who can tell you. Page one, that's gonna be the red one. This is shooting. First, let's go over to image quality. This is the format that you wanna shoot in, whether that's gonna be HD or 4K. And as you can see here on the screen, I have listed what is the difference between HS, S, and SI. There is a quality difference. However, I found that for basic shooting, you really can't tell too much if you're not gonna do anything intense like color grading. You can pixel peep as much as you want, but there's not a massive difference. Don't think that just because you're shooting, uh, for example, 4K HS versus S that there's going to be some insane difference. There will be a quality difference, but it's not gonna be so startling that you're gonna go, oh shoot, I did it in the wrong mode. So don't freak out if you accidentally shoot in one of the other settings. It may not look you know, amazing if you blow it up on a big screen and go and post, but it's also not going to just completely turn your camera into you know, like a 1990s VHS. Don't worry about that. What it will affect is how much SD card you burn through. So if that's a concern, you know, maybe go for a middle setting um, rather than go down to HD. So that might be one reason that you wanna change that. Now keep in mind that if you max it out, if you do the XAVC HS 4K, that's going to require a special SD card. It's gonna require a V90 if you wanna shoot in anything that's not 24 or 30 frames a second. Once you get up to the higher frame rates, which we'll get to in a second, uh, just know that yes, you're gonna to have to use a V90 card. Speaking of those frame rates, if we go over to movie settings, this is where we can select 60, 30, 24, or 120. Note that not every single setting, every single file format has that. So for example, if I do the HS 4K, I'm only allowed 60, 24, and 120. 30 doesn't exist, not sure why. So when we move to the record setting menu, this actually does have an effect, not only on how much data we're burning through, but also the quality of the image um, when we go into post-production. So if you do want to use a lot of heavy color grading, this might be where you want to go 422 um, and go with a higher bit because you're going to need those extra pixels and that extra data. S and Q, that's slow and quick. So how do I explain this? There's two different ways of shooting slow motion versus higher frame rate. So for example, you can shoot in 60 frames a second, but not play it back that quickly. You could play it in what looks like a, it's called sport mode or smoothing mode on televisions where it's 60 frames a second, but it's played back at normal real life speed. The other way that you can shoot 60 frames a second is then in post, you slow it down and turn it into those 30 frames a second by taking 60 frames and splitting it over two seconds instead of one second. So instead of packing a whole bunch of frames into one second, you've distributed it over a longer period of time so it plays back slowly. Now, why would you wanna do this? Well, if you shoot in 60 frames a second by itself, flat, plain, and you select on here both 60 and 60, that means that it's going to play back in that sport smoothing mode, but it also gives you more frames per second to be able to stabilize your footage. But if you do something like, for example, record frame rate at 120, and you have it play back at say 30, you can see here at the bottom, it'll actually change and say, you know, four times quick mode, one fourth quick mode. Um, it'll tell you what it's gonna look like when you play it back, no matter what frame rate you shoot in. So this is really cool because it allows you to shoot slow-mo and see like how slow is that actually going to look. Or you can just straight up shoot in 60 because you're going to be balancing or stabilizing in post-production. And same with your file format mode. You can go into record settings and you can change that from 422 to 420, 10-bit, whichever one that you prefer. Proxy settings, I normally don't do proxy in camera, but what I do is I just dual record SD cards, for example, and I just do proxy on my, um, my laptop, but you can do it here if you so choose. APS-C shooting, just note that on this camera, you can use an APS-C lens. 
Then you can go to lens compensation. There's shading, chromatic aberration, distortion compensation, depending on what lens that you attach to this camera. Mine is disabled because I'm using a full frame Tamron right here, so it doesn't enable that feature. For media, I'm not gonna click this button, but you can format through the camera. Um, I never format until right before I'm ready to shoot. I leave my SD cards alone, and literally the minute up until getting ready to shoot, I will format it just because I like to have my glass slipper. If you haven't watched that other video, I'll link it in the description box below, but it talks about how to save backups uh, as emergencies because you just never know. Record media settings. This is choosing slot one or slot two. You can click on here and say, you know, standard, meaning it goes one at a time. And once it fills one, it jumps to the other, or you can do simultaneous. If you're working with another editor and you need to hand off footage to them as soon as the shoot is done, you can do that and just record on both SD cards, keep one for yourself and hand the other one off to them. Another cool thing to do is you can do auto switch on or off. What I like to do is since these V90 cards are so expensive for slow-mo, I like to make slot one just a standard SD card, class 10, 128 gigabytes. And then my second slot is where I manually switch to when I do slow-mo. You can also, and I highly recommend this, have slot one be your primary footage and slot two be your B-roll. So you can swap back and forth and that way you don't have a whole bunch of files just mixed in together. When you go into post and download SD cards, it's very clear what the primary footage and the B-roll footage is. Now let's go over to file settings. This one is actually pretty useful, especially someone like me that shoots multiple films at the exact same time. You can go into the file number and you can tell it whether to be a series or a reset. And uh, if you shoot multiple SD cards, you're gonna have multiple files that are the same name in post-production. So what I like to do is I go into the series and I like to just reset it per project, but I like to have it continue doing the numbering system no matter what SD card I swap to. And if you go to file format, for example, right here, I have something like, um, you know, ballet, which is a shoot that I'm doing and I'm doing, you know, another one and I might name it fencing. Um, one, two, three, four, five, and ballet, one, two, three, four, five. That way in post-production, I know what project this file is associated with. Very handy if you're like me and you're doing a ton of projects at once. Shooting mode, when you go into exposure, you're gonna see that you can choose aperture, program, priority, shutter priority, or manual exposure. Um, that's just up to you. Again, just follow the rule that shutter speed should always be equal, preferably double to whatever you have. Um, if you go under, it's an artistic choice, but just know that the frame rate will look a little interesting. Shutter and silent, you can change those preferences if you want, it has nothing to do with the actual creative setup of it, but it's just a user preference. Audio recording, this is important if you want onboard audio to be recorded. Uh, I would say that no matter what, you should always record onboard audio. And it's only because sometimes when you have completely silent footage, it's a little weird to edit in post-production. If anything, having some sort of reference would be great. I talk to myself on camera when I'm shooting, especially for documentary work. So I listen to my infield notes by recording on the camera. But just note that if you plug in an external microphone right here, it will override the onboard camera and it will instead record to that. So it really is just the one channel. Don't think you can do stereo on this. It's not that fancy. But if you go to record level, um, you can see it does say channel one and channel two right there, but um, you can just go ahead and set it to about, you know, negative 12 to negative six is what you're looking for. So for me, that's about 22 on my camera. The other thing that you should note on here is wind noise reduction. I just turned that off because it's a little wonky on this camera. I prefer to do that in post or just put a dead cat on my microphone and audio display level. You do want that on so that if you are recording, you can see if your audio is peaking or not. Time code, another useful feature, if you're doing multiple cameras, you can set the time code to each other so that you know when the two cameras synced up, especially if you're not using a digital slate. Image stabilization. This is one of the primary reasons why I bought this camera. Now it's not perfect because you have to make sure you do the settings right. So if you go into the steady shot settings, we've got two different types that you can choose from. Active is the high end Sony gyroscope. So it looks at the data within the camera. It knows where it was in space. And in post-production, you can use that to fully stabilize using the data that was recorded. Standard just means that it's looking at the lens, the horizontal and vertical shifting, and it's compensating that way. Now there is a, I believe 1.1 crop. It doesn't actually say on the camera here but there is a crop in order to activate this. Um, and so just note that there will just be a little bit of it, but it's not too noticeable, especially if you're using a wide lens, which will automatically help with stabilization to begin with. 
For steady shot settings, you can do manual or auto. I tend to just use manual because if I'm switching lenses or focal lengths, I wanna be able to click right here and say it was 24, 28, 30, whatever it is. Zoom, this is a digital optical zoom only. Um, it's something that I don't use because I would either use a zoom lens or I would just reframe my camera. So I do not use that. Shooting display, this is great if you're a beginner. I tend to not use it because this is very distracting for me. I don't want to see grid lines all over the place. I want to look at the final composition. But if you're just learning how to do rule of thirds, golden ratio, things like that, then you might want to use the grid system. I do use marker display though. This is a way of showing the center marker, the aspect ratio. These are important for me for compositional framing. And so I do use that along with the safety zone of 90% just so I can kind of see what's going on. On to the next page, the pink one we've got on page one, exposure. So this is not the exposure from the previous page that was aperture priority. This is the actual ISO. Um, you can also access through the function button that's on the back, which is much easier to get to. However, you can go in here and manually set it if you feel like it. If you go over to exposure compensation, um, you can just leave everything here alone. I wouldn't mess with that too much. You want a pretty accurate representation of what you're seeing, or at least as close as you can get on this little LED LCD screen. Metering, you can go into multi or standard or center, whatever you would like to use. And then face priority, you can turn that on and off. I tend to not use it too much. White balance, white balance is important. Um, you can go into auto, which I recommend you do not do because if you pan from say a 5% tan wall to a 5% cool gray wall, it's gonna be a little confused on what is truly white and it might mess up your settings. Especially if you transition from a room that's lit tungsten to the outside world, it's gonna transition a little funky but uh, it depends on you know, what you're trying to accomplish. And again, you can use the function button on the back to quickly get to it, but you can also do it here, especially if you wanna set one that's custom or manual. There's plenty of different settings in here, pretty standard on every single Sony mirrorless camera, so this is no different than the other ones. Color and tone. On this one, I just never use the creative look. Think of those as Instagram filters for your camera. I don't use them. If I'm gonna do that, it's gonna be in post-production, but picture profile. Once again, this is where people get really weird and they get into arguments about which picture profile you should be using. And the answer is there is no right answer. You do you, you pick whatever you think is best for the project. A lot of times people like to shove S log two or S log three down your throat. And I say, hey, it's not always great to use. It's got that really, you know, desaturated flat look that not everybody, especially someone like me, likes. And I just don't always like shooting an S log. Also, if you shoot in darker conditions or like me, run and gun documentary, it can be really hard to shoot S log because it's just hard to see things and it's hard to overexpose. Previously, I was shooting a lot of helicopters and using S log for that was pretty good if I had decent cloud cover. So just make sure that you're picking the picture profile that is right for you. Don't listen to other people, play around, see what it looks like in post, color grade it, and just see what look that you personally enjoy. Nobody's gonna look at your footage and be like, ooh, was that S log three? Or did you just heavy color grade that? Just don't listen to them. Last is zebra display. This one actually is very useful, especially if you are shooting S-Log because it allows you to see what is blown out on the screen or overexposed. So you can double check your white. So if you click on zebra displays, you can turn those on and off. If you turn them on, you're gonna see those diagonal zebra lines essentially on anything that is too bright or blown out or highlighted on to the next setting, which is the purple menu, autofocus and manual focus. This just depends on what situation you're in. A lot of times for run and gun, I will just shoot on autofocus because I have more important things to do, like seeing where people are moving, where animals are moving and track that. And uh, I am not able to manually focus and pull focus that way. So you can click on here again, once more, you can just click the function button on the back and there's a setting there to get to it quickly, but you can choose autofocus or manual focus. And also make sure that if your camera has an autofocus or manual focus on the side, then you need to make sure that you click that because the physical locking of that will override your camera settings. If not, you're gonna be very confused as to why it's not working. Now, what's really cool on this camera is if you enable the touch feature, you can just tap on the screen where you would like things to be highlighted and you can click on that and say, hey, autofocus on that. We'll get to that menu later. But for this one, autofocus, I use continuous autofocus for right now. Autofocus transition speed, five is pretty normal. 
and shift sensitivity three is also fine. It just depends on how fast you want to rack focus and be able to switch subjects and autofocus on new things. Focus area, again, you can click center, wide. For example, um, if you are doing a documentary, you may not want it to be perfectly centered like this. So on my monitor right here, I can see that I am perfectly centered, but in a documentary, you tend to not have people like this and you're gonna see the autofocus move right now, but you tend to have people sit, oh, I guess it's still locking. This is my A7 III, so it's, a, it's not quite as good, but mo for the most part, you have the rule of thirds and people in documentaries sit like this. So you may want to have the focus box here instead of in the center so that it looks at their eyes and their face shape here. Same thing if you switch to the other side, if it's an interview and somebody is sitting this way, you wanna make sure that that box sits here instead of in the center so that you can actually focus on the correct subject. For the focus area, you can highlight it. This is very useful because a lot of times, especially on this tiny little screen, it's hard to see what's going on, which is why I use a larger monitor right here when I'm recording to be able to see what's going on. But you can highlight it in white, so that uh, puts like a little white rim on everything that is in focus. And then when you go down to the next menu, the face and eye focus, this is a super powerful tool on the Sony a7S III, which is another reason why I upgraded to it is because when I was running and gunning, it was kind of hard to keep focus on people's eyes. So you can even click if you want it to be the left eye or the right eye. And then you can go in, you can select if you want it human or animal. I have done a test on this. Uh, that video is gonna be coming out soon where I follow my dog and also human subjects and I see how these three cameras stack up against each other. So you can look forward to that one to see how much that autofocus changes from camera to camera. And then if you go to registration, uh, register faces priority, you can turn that on or off. I leave it on because it's the line of work I do. I don't really do a lot of landscape filming or just product shoots. I do a lot of people and animals and therefore I turn that on. Focus assist is very helpful, especially again, you're using a tiny, tiny little LCD screen. So you can click on that and it will punch in about one times the magnification when you turn, uh, let's see, oh, this is a Tamron. Yep, this is the focus. So when you go to focus, it will automatically punch in so that you can get nice crisp focus if you're going manual. Peaking display, also very helpful. Um, you can change the color on this. Again, you can go white, blue, red. I tend to pick something that's kind of unnatural like red, so it's much easier to see. Next page, the blue one under playback. You can go in and do your own settings here. This won't affect how things are necessarily recorded. Um, this is more just user function on the camera. So just go ahead, play around um, and customize things for yourself in here. Next page under network, this is the green page. You can use your smartphone to control this camera, which all the Sony cameras do. Uh, the downside is sometimes when you plug in external monitors to these cameras, it disables certain things like um, it messes with the autofocus and 4K instead of HD. So just know that if anything gets a little wonky, it's probably because of the external monitor or it's because you have control with smartphone turned on and that has sort of a chain effect on other menu settings. So if there's anything where you're like, why can't I do this? The first thing I would do is just go in, turn off your external monitors and turn off control smartphone. This is a pretty handy feature, especially if you shoot for social media because you can immediately send it to your smartphone and post online without having to dump the SD card and go through a whole post-production workflow. And the last one for yellow, this is the toolbox. Again, it's just customization for you as the camera operator. You can go in and change from PAL to NTSC. Now remember, PAL and NTSC do not mean that you have physically changed locations, gone to Europe, etc. It means whatever you want the final format to be recorded and delivered in. So you only need to change this if you have a overseas client who has requested for you to change that. Just don't forget to change it back to the correct format. You can go in and customize all your keys here. I tend to never do this. I just use the camera by default the way it is. So if I work with other teammates or other videographers or an assistant, this camera is pretty standard. So all of our cameras match and we're not clicking buttons and being like, well, this is autofocus on mine, but it's different on yours. That can really be confusing and you could accidentally push some wrong buttons to change settings. So I just leave mine standard and I don't customize it. If you don't collaborate, it might be great to be able to customize things for yourself, but it's not for me. 
touch operation, this is where we want to enable things. We want to turn touch operation on. That way we can click in order to do things like autofocus and touch tracking. So if you go there to the bottom, you see there's touch focus, touch tracking. You can select whichever one that you want. Power setting option. This is another one that I make sure to change. I go into the power save and I change it to 30. Why? Well, I'm not a photographer. So if this thing shuts off in the middle of me trying to set up lighting and I'm looking at a preview, it is incredibly frustrating. I have an external battery setup that I use for these cameras. So I'm not worried about burning through batteries. I just set it to 30 minutes so I can see the preview constantly while I'm setting up lighting and the composition of the frame. And then I go into the auto power off temp and I set it to high. This also drives me nuts because again, these cameras are just being safe. They're making sure not to kill themselves. So if you click standard, it could be in the middle of winter in Colorado here and I could just be indoors and it will shut itself off thinking it's overheated because my house heater's turned on. So usually what I do is I set it to high and that is sufficient. It will warm up just a little bit when I'm shooting in 4K, 120 frames a second in a warm environment. But I've also brought these cameras to Dubai in the middle of the desert and they haven't overheated. So I think you're fine. And last of all, you can connect your camera to your laptop. You've got USB, you've got the external HDMI and different setup options here. Again, these are just extra tools for you, but they have no effect on the actual recording. Just keep in mind that some monitors, if you plug in an external HDMI camera and you shoot in 4K, it may not fully record. You have to make sure you get a high quality monitor that allows you to do 4K recording while that's plugged in. If not, you will be downgraded to HD. So make sure to go with a verified high end monitor that is industry standard so that you don't get locked out of your own settings. And make sure to subscribe because in the future I'm releasing that Sony showdown of mirrorless cameras, the a7 III versus IV versus S3. So you can take a look and see which camera you wanna buy next, or if you're buying it for the first time, which one fits your budget and your style. Thanks for watching. Go film something now that your camera is set up and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.